So um, just before we start, uh, do our people here, would they consider, would you consider yourself a fan or a follower of Tupac Shakur's music or Bob Marley's music? Okay, which one? Marley. Marley. Bob Marley. So in Sierra Leone, it's one word, Bob Marley. <laughs> and then Tupac is the other. Okay, Bob Marley. Uh, the whole country is Bob Marley land to a degree I don't think I've ever seen before. So, any Tupac fans here? Okay, so, all right. Very good. I, I wanted to start with that because, can we do this? This is a photograph um, from the front lines in, 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 during the war in Sierra Leone when I was there, one of the times I was, one of the many times I was there. Because what you're gonna hear for fans of Tupac and Marley, and I don't know if there's any Rambo fans. No? <laughs> Usually not. Um, uh, that Pop's culture superstars are interpreted locally. It's a really important idea. Um, they also can be manipulated, and you can't predict how they're going to be locally interpreted. And that's a big deal because um, there is this idea that Marley is about peace, love, and togetherness, right? And, and that's really something that um, has, is promoted, uh, in fact. Um, most of the world doesn't see that at all, or that as a component of something much larger. Um, so this will, might be, these interpretations might be a little surprising. Some of what you're gonna hear has to do with exploitation of their popularity for the purposes of, of very extreme war, style of warfare. So that's what we're gonna look at. So. They're a big deal, these three, um, Tupac, Marley, and, and Rambo. Uh, less so Rambo today, um, although Sylvester Stallone keeps making movies of, of, uh, of Rambo, I've noticed. Um, so what about these three? Um, Marley's about injustice for most people in the world. Marley appeals to alienated young people, which is, uh, just about everybody at some point. Um, Marley gives an idea of, gives a sense of like what to do, like he helps you analyze injustice. In Sierra Leone, it, people would say, it's like Marley is talking about our country and us. And he became, as we'll see, the kind of the godfather for the rebels. Everything was informed by, by him. The most important song in the world by Marley is get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight, stand up for your rights. So that's the one. What about Tupac? Tupac is an amazing uh, artist. Um, he, the, I would say in the world, he's so authentic. Right? It, it, the, what, what is appealing about him? Mostly for male youth. Um, but what is, it, what is it about him? his honesty, he has an emotional range that could not possibly be, be wider, it seems, for an artist. Um, he's known for his honesty. He's known for telling the truth. Um, he's known for being fearless and um, so many other things he predicts. He talks about suicide. He talks about he's gonna die early, which, well, some people believe Tupac lives, maybe not, um, but uh, <laughs> he's known for telling it like it is having empathy sometimes, having intense anger in other songs. I mean, the scariest song I've ever heard is Hit Him Up. Um, and that song, of course, was one of the main ones, the featured ones that was manipulated by, by uh, military leaders. So what about Rambo, or sometimes known as just Joan in uh, <laughs> Sierra Leone? Um, Rambo was surprised, I mean, to me, surprisingly, uh, influential for female use. Um, he can show how you can be resourceful as one person against the forces. All forces are against you. And one of the things that he said in his first movie, which really resonated, was, but I didn't do anything. Why are you against me? I didn't do anything. So we'll get back to that, because that's, that's a big, big idea from all three. Um, and you can fight without high-tech weapons. Okay, so this was a bush war. This was a terror-based war. 
And the one thing they wanted to do was avoid fighting conventional uh, forces, because you're gonna lose. Just like most terror groups today. Did Hamas go into Israel and say, okay, where's the Israeli army? I don't think so. That's not how terror groups operate. They do their, they get their attention with something extreme, and then they melt into the tunnels or forests. One of the big deals for Sierra Leone was the first two movies take place in rainforests. Ah, Sierra Leone is almost completely white rainforest, except the areas that have been cut down for diamond mines. But beyond that, most of it is rainforest. Okay, um, how did this book come to be? Well, it wasn't planned. Um, I was working for the SSRC on human rights and um, refugees, this big project on Sierra Leonean refugees was the, was the group that we were all looking at. And uh, I went to this place in a remote part of Gambia, it has to be along the river because that's all there is. It was way up country, extremely hot. And there was a refugee camp up there that no visitors ever come. And I'm a white man, that's a big deal. Like, who's that? All right, we would need to meet him because you know, the UNHCR will actually talk to that guy. So uh, I was seen, I was, I was a real focus of attention. So the leaders of the refugee camp, I talked to them one afternoon and we arranged 10 o'clock the next morning, why don't you come and we'll bring some, we'll invite some, uh, some adults, you know, some refugee adults to come and meet you. Oh my God, what, what, it was a huge crowd. And um, before I sort of started my questions with refugees, I always ask first, so what's your story? How did you get here? Why are you a refugee? And instantly people stood up, men and women, and started talking about Tupac. And I thought, what are they talking about? I had no idea. And then there was this Bomani word. What is Bomani? And, and, and so uh, I, people slowed down and started talking one by one. And then I understood in January 6th, so there's another January 6th, Sierra Leone, that was the, the major invasion um, in Sierra Leone in 1999. And it's known as January 6th. Um, and in many parts of the city, rebels came in in white pickup uh, trucks and white vans. On the sides were painted Tupac songs. Hit them up, all eyes on me, only God can judge me. Even California love, which I didn't expect, but people love Tupac. So um, they wore bandanas, Tupac wears bandanas, so does Rambo. Um, they were playing Tupac music. And this is important. They were as high as is possible a human being could be. Tupac followers use cocaine, not just marijuana. We'll get to the drug side in a moment. And what about on the other side of the other neighborhoods in the city? Vans came in playing um, reggae music, Bob Marley, Bob Marley, and um, came out the rebels in dreadlocks and wearing Bob Mali t-shirts. The Tupac uh, attackers were all in uh, Tupac t-shirts. And very, high, very, very high on marijuana. And so there was a soundtrack to their, um, to their terror practices. And this was probably the most extreme example of terror warfare in modern history in Freetown. So it was seriously, intentionally terrifying. So, you know, I mean, Hamas would be familiar with some of this stuff. This, this is what terror groups do. So this is how it started. And I started going around and asking people uh, everywhere I went. I had an amazing com conversation with um, uh, ex-combatants from the Lord's Resistance Army in like 2002 in uh, Ajumani in northern uh, Uganda. And, you know, I went to their program and learned about their training and everything. And at the end, I just asked some of the guys, I said, so just wondering, do you guys like Tupac? Oh, my God. They want to have talk about Tupac. This went on for almost an hour or more. And, you know, they knew all about Tupac. And you're from his country, so you know. So is he alive? Because we don't think he's alive. Because how could he be dead? Because all these songs are coming out. So we think he's still alive. So we follow Tupac lives. And, it's just, it was like, it was incredible. And some of these kids were young and they knew Tupac. They knew Biggie, they knew East Side, West Side. 
all the details uh, and, uh, well, their interpretation of it, I think. So to get back to Sierra Leone, where did this all this come from? I had to sort of track it like, kind of like investigative journalism. Where did, you know, to track this story? Because, uh, and what, what happened was, uh, this story actually started, um, and I'll get to this on the gender side, the, this story actually started during the Atlantic slave trade um, because the Portuguese and then particularly the British were only interested in taking males, boys and men as, as slaves. So they created this massive imbalance between women and men. There were huge numbers of uh, an excess. And in a place like Sierra Leone, as soon as you know who you are and can say your name, you know you're getting married because that's what adults do. That's how you become an adult. So what about, what do you do if there's no one to marry, basically? Um, and so it created this idea, I'm jumping a little bit, that femininity was not, this is not about disempowerment, not in Sierra Leone. Femininity is about being dangerous, dangerously powerful. And that idea started in the era of the slave trade. So to, to, um, the, the, the frame of reference to get closer to today um, is, is Shaka Stevens. There he is with Kurt Waldheim, the former UN security, oh, what is he, secretary general for the UN. Um, and uh, he's not particularly impressed with Kurt Waldheim. I don't think many people impressed Shaka Stevens. Shaka Stevens was a bit of a, um, he was, uh, it, it, can you run a state in a more neo-colonial way than Shaka Stevens? I don't think so. Um, he took, um, so Sierra Leone, as I'm sure you know, has not so many anymore, but at that time, some of the best diamonds in the world, alluvial. Shaka Stevens set up a patronage system that took them all that some of it, quite a bit of it before him, went through the state. After he got in there, nothing got it. Got it got me. I think there was $20,000 over, or how long was he there? 18 years? Um, got to the state coffers. So the fake state idea is something I came up with because people complain about Sierra Leone, you know, it's weak and it's whatever. Uh, the tradition of bureaucracy and so on is not very strong. Yeah, well, that was by intention, okay? It's a, it is fake. So a lot of scholars call it a facade or wafer-thin bureaucracy or something like that. Yeah, because he was running a business. The government was a front for his business. Now, when you run a kleptocratic state, well, how do you keep things in line? Because obviously you're blatantly disregarding rights protections, what a normal state would do, and you're also blatantly taking it all the, 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 the value, right, the, all the resources for yourself. You need state force. So he invented special groups. One was the ISU, one was called, the, the ISU was called Isuchu, uh, it was a nickname, and then SSD was called Shaka Stevens's Dogs. So these were the two, the social security, I mean, the, the special security division was SSD, social, uh, Shaka Stevens' dogs. So that's what was going on in the country. And then this is really important for understanding this because virtually every Sierra Leonean speaks Creole. And the rebels wouldn't let you speak uh, uh, your first language, Mende, Temne, Kono, Kisi, all the different languages because then you could be talking behind their back because it was ethnically mixed. So you only had to use Creole. So why is this important? Because it's a Creole version. This is from uh, slaves that were returned in their wisdom. The British, after slaving for centuries, started saying, no, no, we must abolish slavery. And they started bringing slaves back to Freetown, which it was called for freed slaves. And they had a language called Creo. Um, and th this is important because this meant that everybody could understand Bob Martin. Everybody could understand Rambo. 
and at least understand a bit of Tupac who sings, he raps really quickly most of the time. But um, Marley in particular has perfect diction. If you hear Marley in an interview talking, I mean, I don't understand what he's saying half the time. He speaks really fast, but when he sings, he wants you to hear every single word and people were able to take it all in. Creole was the key for Sierra Leone. So I mentioned this background on slavery um, and youth alienation. One of the things that happened starting in the, in the uh, colonial era is, um, you know, the British would give guns to both sides in the conflict and then whoever lost were captured and then the guys were taken as slaves. So um, in order to have all these fights, which were really fomented by the British, you need, um, you need fighters and they were called war boys. So this whole tradition of using boys as fighters started during the slave time trade. And I think what people don't realize sometimes, I think they don't realize it's like, oh yeah, there was slavery. No, no, there was slavery for centuries, centuries. And so this, this when, when we got to the time of Shaka Stevens, there were all these guys, education, no. Could you, could you go to school secondary? No. Could you get married? No. Uh, so what were your options? They were terrible. You were gonna live a life of public failure. You were gonna be humiliated. And so alienation was very common. And one of the ways there are many words used in Sierra Leone to put down male youth. And one of them is a thug or a tug. And that means a loser, get out. We don't like you. All the problems of Sierra Leone in the war were caused by those bad boys. That basically is a theme, that's a theme so strong in a lot of the analysis of this war. It's their fault. So um, now I think you're starting to see when you're treated that way, why would you not go to Marley and Tupac and Rambo? Obviously you need something for self-belief, you need some validation, you need some inspiration. And there's, again, political repression. There is no peaceful dissent allowed in Sierra Leone during this period. There's a bit now, not much. Um, and so peaceful dissent harshly repressed, you better believe it. And so um, during this period, you couldn't speak out. So this is another reason why, you know, there were no models for like the music was, as I understood under Shaka Stevens, was pretty dull. Um, Shaka Stevens wasn't even interested in like flags of the country. He was interested in flags of his party, the APC. That's what he was interested in. And then diamonds. So um, this is another way of looking at the history of Sierra Leone. I put this together. Can you see everyone? Okay, I don't know if this is if blocking. So there's four decades that I want to talk about really quickly. The first one is the 1960s. This is when marijuana came into the country. And sometimes people call it the weed or the weeds. And you put it in the ground and it goes, I mean, behind a police station in Kenema, it was over the wall. It must have been 15 feet high inside the police station. It's illegal, but you know, whatever. Um, and it is unusually strong. So this picture of Marley, Marley came in with Burning Spear, Peter Tosh, um, all kinds came in. And this was a time of great ferment, particularly in Freetown for youth, the youth. And they were listening to Marley. And then they were trying to, they were doing something that they say to become conscious. So you become conscientized. How do you do that? You have to smoke marijuana. So in Rastafarian, like when you're a Catholic, right, you go and you receive communion if you're a Catholic. And that piece of bread, they say, this is my body, right, Jesus. And then you have that process, this is my blood, and that's the wine. And that's the, the, these are sacraments. What's the sacramental practice for Rastafarians? Ganga, Jamba in, in uh, Sierra Leone. You smoke, you listen to Bob Marley, you become conscious of injustice against you. So right away during, from this period, what did the rebels see? 
marijuana marley. That's the recipe. And that was the key for the whole world. The rebels would boil water with marijuana, and that was the water that all the child soldiers, everybody drank, except the commanders, I think. When you had rice, they put marijuana in there. They made, um, they have a lot of like cassava leaf, potato leaf. They had also jamba leaf. So they would also eat, so the sauces would be marijuana. So kids were high for the entire war. I am not exaggerating. Because it's easier to manipulate. And how do you keep that practice? Keep playing Marley. Every night, the boys smoke marijuana. The girls, we'll get to that. It's a little different for the girls. Okay, what about the 1980s? So this is kind of an amazing thing. Like, how could everybody know Marley? I mean, the movies of John Rambo. Just imagine this. There were these guys with, um, uh, uh, what is it, generators, uh, petrol gen generators <laughs> on a pickup truck. And they had a screen, and they would go to every diamond mine area, every village, and then different neighborhoods and cities, and set up an outdoor theater. And you would pay money and go in. What did everybody want to watch? Rambo. Why does this matter? Because during the war, these were military training videos. Rambo, you had to, everybody had to practice Rambo system. And also, you needed to know Rambo tactics. And this was a very serious in terms of training young people. They had to know Rambo tactics. And so, if you play a generator, you're going to be found out. It's, they're really loud. And later in the war, solar panels came in. But still, you didn't have, the thing that was amazing is because everybody had seen these movies and memorized them, and I'm not exaggerating, um, they didn't have to show the movies to use them as training videos. They'd say, do you remember in the first, the first movie when this happened and all the, the trainees would go, oh yeah, yeah, they all knew. I'll give you an example. During the war, this one female youth I, I interviewed, she said, you know, when the rebels came to us, that's how you talk about how this, the war happened in your village. A lot of people would wait until the rebels would come uh, some would run away, but a lot of people would wait until the rebels came to When the war came to us, okay, when the war came to your village, what did you do? Well, your whole life changes in the, in a snap, right? And if you want to get out of there, you better run. So if you're old and you can't run, that's it for you. The rebels will do what they want. But if she was young and she just ran and she was by herself and she got into the forest outside of her village and she finally stopped. So who did she think of? Her mother, her father, her grandfather? Who did she think of like, what do I do next? I asked her when you got there, what did you say? I said to myself, what would Rambo do? And then she did that. Okay, down here, here comes the guy, right? All right, everybody, all the elders, everybody likes Marley. This is, this is for male youth. This is our guy. All right? Being called a thug. Before Sierra Leoneans, uh, youth heard one word of Tupac. They saw this picture, thug life, tattooed on his belly. What a revelation. And you see the bullet right here for the eye? There's a handgun in the t part of the T. Thug life. What, uh, this guy was a revelation. Oh, you want to call me a thug? Go ahead. I'm proud of it. Yeah, I'm a thug. And I'm proud of it. Now, when you grow up being called a thug and put down as a thug, you may, he's an instant hero. And then he can rap better than anybody. He, can, he talks honestly about everything. I remember some, some, uh, some youth would say, yeah, we know Tupac. Tupac fought in the American War. So Tupac was them. Tupac was like their friend. He was going through exactly what they were going through. And do you know what? That's what Palestinian youth said too. This is worldwide. And also what I didn't realize is that all over the world, you put Marley and Tupac together. So there were, there were gang members. Um, there was a gang and I don't know where it was, in the South Pacific. And 
they gave this, uh, there was this um, interview that they gave and they said, well, first we followed Marley because we wanted to, you know, because there was police brutality, like, ever, like here, right? It was a big issue with youth all over the world. And so they were trying to demonstrate against the, the police and what did the police do, you know, for their rights to not be abused and the police just beat them up and stuff like that. So we first wanted to resist like Marley is what the gang leader said. But then when the, the police, when that didn't work, then we became outlaws like Tupac. There it is. So the, and that's true with the rebels. The, the sort of the softer approach of resistance, that's Marley. When you go all the way, Tupac. So um, what did these three do? So this is a, um, this is before I had this conversation. I was there during the war. I took this picture and found it when I was going through my photographs. There's an All Eyes on Me t-shirt, a Tupac t-shirt. So what, what did they find from them? Bob Marley, inspiration. Tupac, friendship. It's just like us. And he's our leader. Marley is, you know, the one who helps us analyze, you know, the oppression we're on. And then Rambo really shows you how to fight back as one person. So all three were really important. The messages, when you put them together, is we didn't do anything, but everybody's picking on us. The system is attacking me, and I didn't do anything. If you want to understand Tupac Shakur, listen to even the first few verses of um, Only God Can Judge Me. And can I, can I use a swear word here? Is that <laughs> Well, it's being filmed. I have no idea. <laughs> so here's one. Hey, Mr. Police, can't you see? There's a million motherfuckers stressing just like me. Only God can judge me. Wow. You want to tell me that doesn't resonate with young people all over the world? Today, it does. And he talks about it. He opens, uh, I've been trapped since birth. Whoa. He talks about his family in a hearse. He talks about, he's thinking of suicide. He regularly says he's going to die early. Uh, my God, this guy, you know, there's nobody like him. And that's what the a Sierra Leonean's youth would tell me on a regular basis. He's the best. There's nobody else in, in rap except Tupac. He's number one. And for a long time, it's not like that now, but for a long time, he was it. So... So the world is upside down. We didn't do anything and people are against us. That's what they drew from those three. So the terror warfare recipe, this is a very deep book. And one of the things I learned about is how do you do terror warfare? So this is on the front lines. There were, <laughs> this is, th these are the kind of fighters and ch child soldiers all over the world. Does this guy look scary? He's terrified. He's wearing a teddy bear t-shirt, for Christ's sake, and holding an AK. All right, and this guy's got a mortar in his hand. Does he look confident? Not exactly. So um, the, 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 the big guy, I mean, the, the older man, is he was um, pointing this <clears throat> at my, um, my groin, and I sort of took the hell out of there. So anyway, um, what, how do you do terror warfare? What I learned in Sierra Leone and what is, resonates to violent extremist groups to this day is this recipe. You exploit weaknesses in governance. If you want to fight terror, uh, terror groups today, do something about your governance. Um, exploit alienated youth. Unfortunately, all over the world, there's so many of them. So this is the youngest population of human beings in history, the youngest population is in Africa. I would say the second youngest is the Middle East. I don't think there's a whole bit of difference. The Palestinians are super useful. The Yemenis are very useful and so on. So during the war, they called it marriage. Um, it wasn't. I interviewed a lot of female youth. It was sexual slavery. Um, there is a chapter in the book called The War on Girls to try to understand why was sexual violence so obsessive, so extreme. And I can give examples later if you want. But then for the boys, you had to drug them and manipulate them to be your instruments of terror. The main instruments. There were, there were small girls units, but 
Not that many. And if you were a fighter, a girl fighter, you're going to get raped all the time as well. So um, then you terrorize civilians. Now, this is really, uh, I've done a lot of work in Central Africa. This is not how warfare works in Central Africa. So the war in Burundi took place almost exactly the same number of years um, as Sierra Leone. The estimates are 300,000 died in, um, in Burundi and 50,000 approximately. Some say it's 10,000, some say it's 75, but generally it's 50,000, which is a lot of human beings in a war. I'm not making small of that, but why didn't they kill more? Because they sure could have. Because the issue is terror. You don't terrorize people. You have to keep the most of them alive. That's the point. So to show that you're, you, you demonstrate your strength because you're driving people away into making them refugees or IDPs. Um, you avoid fighting opposition forces, conventional forces, because you're going to lose, right? You got drugged up kids with AKs. You're going to lose. So, and the last one is you, you need money to drive your organization. In this case, it was diamonds. Right now, violent extremist groups in West Africa are focused on, on gold. So they exploited pop culture icons for war. As I said, this is a, known as a, a bandaria or banda on his head. That, that means the upside down American flag, that's Rambo. So, um, so the ideological guide for the, for the rebels was, um, was, was a Marley. Fode Sanko, the leader of the RUF, um, was known to, according to all my interviews, every single speech he ever gave, he quoted Bob Marley. Particularly get up, stand up, but others as well. Um, you have to non you do nonstop drugging, and as I said, because of Marley, it was easy to link the two with, with marijuana. The, some units really were unusually fierce they were the Tupac groups, and then there was one group that named themselves after Tupac was the West Side Boys, which is, became its own militia. They used heavy violence, and they were known to be cocaine users, as well, of course, as marijuana. That's a given. In fact, it was so common, it wasn't even considered a drug by a lot of the, um, the rebels. <clears throat> and actually, everybody smoked, and everybody listened to marijuana. Uh, to, to, uh, Everybody smoked marijuana and everybody listened to uh, Marley on all sides of the war. Um, and then Rambo was used as military training videos, as I said, and then there were lots of, I counted something like 30 different commanders who gave themselves the name of some sort of Rambo, Red Goat Rambo, Commanding Officer Rambo, Nasty Rambo, Young Rambo. What happened after the war? This is really interesting. <clears throat> Young people took interpretations that were exploited for their heroes and then drew them back to help inform what to do after the war when you're still hated you're still alienated so rambo kind of moved on although in 2005 i did notice there was a practice in freetown that people would go for easter sunday you go to church as a family and then as a family you go to a video parlor and watch a rambo film on Easter Sunday. Um, and then Tupac, here's just an example from one of his many, many followers in Sierra Leone. <clears throat> there are so many sufferers. Suffera. A suffera is a word used by Marley, and it's used in Sierra Leone. There are so many sufferers here. I used to hear about people who succeeded, like Tupac. Tupac is an anti-hero. Tupac is the underclass, but he made it, right? I'm from nowhere. How many young people think that about themselves in the world? But someday I can make it. Tupac is an example for us. And then for Marley, he was always able to inspire people to move forward. And this is from a female youth. Like Bob Marley says, don't give up. Don't give up now. Boom. So you could hear that today uh, in all over Sierra Leone. So this is the last slide. Um, what do we learn from this? The last chapter has a, uh, a framework for what to do, what, how do we draw from this, and this is a very simplified version of only some of it is, 
um, you have to start seeing societies from the perspective of the, the alienated youth majority. Majority, not the relatives of leaders who come in for all, you know, that are brought in, the unthreatening ones that are, that usually speak a European language, correct? And then say charis charismatic young people, they usually don't represent many youth, usually other elite youth. Um, but you have to try to figure out what is it like to live in a society when the world seems to be, the forces are against you. And if you do that, and if you look at urban youth, I f think it would be impossible. I would include this city or Boston. I think it would be impossible for kids anywhere. This would be my theory. You go ahead and test it. If they don't mention the police, I'd be shocked. So, um, where the innocents are attacked, but they didn't do anything. Just like Rambo said, but I didn't do anything. You learn from insurgent and violent extremist groups. That would be helpful. What do they see? What are they exploiting? They're exploiting governments that don't work well, that attack certain citizens. If you learn, if you try to see a society in that way, you can see what they're exploiting because it's pretty clear. And that, that that can be your starting point. Not what you want to do, what they want to do. Um, and then mainstream governance, I mean, it really is, ask any violent extremist, <coughs> what is it really about? It's about governance. And d does it really work? Does it protect citizens? Does it supply um, services to people? Is it equal? Well, that's not really working here. Now, is it in this society? But these are the kinds of things that governments need to do to maintain a stable society and to be representative in all those things. Anyway, so that's it. Thank you very much. You've sort of given us this fantastic insight into the sort of transnational or transcontinental narrative of resistance. Um, and with a, with, with a you know, particular focus on Syria, yeah, but clearly with resonances elsewhere. And, and, and so I have, a, first of all, a method question. So for, you know, for, for, for those here you know, who, 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 who are interested in doing research in these sorts of things, I mean, the way you presented your, you know, your sort of discovery was just serendipity, you just stumbled across these people. But there's more to it than serendipity, it doesn't you, know, you have to be, you have to cultivate your luck as a field worker. So could you, um, and, and, and you, you've stumbled across, stumbled, I mean, you have, you have un, uncovered something that is so ubiquitous and so obvious once you've made this point, mm -hmm. but somehow it's been missed by pretty much everyone else, I would think, with the exception of Paul Richard. But, um, so what is it about fieldwork method that you would want to impart to, to, to students here about you know, going to places around the world which are very disordered, very, um, very opaque in many ways, and, and coming out and, and actually seeing what is there. Thank you. Well, um, this, this, this needs a little background story because I, I didn't know really what my methods are. I'm an anthropologist and I was um, and I, when I came here, I was asked to teach a course on how to do research. I'm a qualitative researcher. How to do research in w war and post-war environments. And so I was putting together a course, and Professor Masrana's book wasn't out yet. So I had to, there was almost nothing on this field. When I said, when I was asked, could you put a course together? I thought, stupidly, I thought, yeah, sure. And then I realized there was almost nothing written about it. So I had to create most, almost all of the materials, like 80% of the materials I put together and I added to them every year when I was teaching. Um, and so I was able to put that together as a book when I worked for the State Department and I was seconded to EGAD in Djibouti. Um, and it's called, um, I can share this, uh, it's called, it's a PDF as well, it's called Trust-Based Qualitative Field Methods and Professor Maserano wrote a uh, a lovely endorsement for the book, uh, which I thank you for. 
Um, and, and why is that? That's just sort of to give you a background, because the, the, it, it, if, um, if you want to focus on something, it's how do you build trust? So the starting point of all research, field research, is why should anyone tell you the truth? Start with that. Doing these quantitative surveys, if they don't trust you, of course you're going to lie. Right? Go into a neighborhood in most of the world. Where they live is illegal. What they're, how they're making a living, that's illegal. So of course they're going to lie. Um, and if you have a, you know, a clipboard, it's over. And I've seen this in, um, in it, I, I have a, a few times followed surveyors around, and it's, it's laughable to hear what people tell them. But you know, when you have your quantitative data, you can run the data and so forth. Well, it's going to be bogus <laughs> in a lot of situations. So what do you do? Um, there are a lot of practices that I think come from common sense. One of the things I realized teaching here is that everybody I'm teaching is an elite. You can think you're not. But if you're at the Fletcher School, you better believe you are. And, uh, and if you're an elite, um, all of us get cues as elites um, for how to, we don't, we're not even aware of it, but we have to be as a good researcher. How are you talking to people who aren't like you, right? Watch yourself next time you pass a homeless person in this, uh, in this city. What do you do? You look away, right? or you look down at the person, there's some cue. The homeless person can tell you what the way they're treated, right? You need to know what that is if you want to do a study with young homeless people. So some of my students were just, I could, I could tell, field research was not going to be for them because it was really difficult. And I gave really basic, simple exercises, and some people couldn't do it. Um, I didn't tell them that, but it was pretty evident. So what do you do? When I go out, I dress like a primary school teacher uh, in the sense that I try to look around at what's a way to be appropriate. If your clothes are dirty, you're not respecting anybody. If you're wearing a t-shirt, I'm not a youth. So I wear a button-down shirt. I wear, you know, I stay in a hotel, they press my clothes, all that stuff to show that I respect you. And then I try, I never use focus groups, I use peer groups. I'll set up with, you know, female youth, they're gonna usually wanna be interviewed separately for male youth. And for guys out there, they will talk to you, no question about it. Um, and if, I'm, if you're, you have to know what your strengths are and your weaknesses as a researcher, because we all have them. So it's called trust-based methods, and I just created that, I don't know. It, I had to call it something. Because what you do is you promote, you cultivate trust. So you go down the same you know, street in a neighborhood or the same path in a village every day. And you don't rush and you talk to people. And sometimes people will say, Mr. Mark, you know, um, you know we talked yesterday. I said, yeah, that was really great, so thank you. Um, yeah, can I talk to you again? Because I wasn't telling you the truth. Yeah, sure, okay. It's like a confession. And, then you can't tell you. Um, and so, so you use, this book really goes through um, the kinds of things you do. Uh, and they're really basic things for how you um, empower someone. Uh, in a, in a, a peer group is, Peer group is organized by the people you're going to interview. Female youth, they like to lean on each other a lot. Sometimes, you know, like put their hand on their friend's knee because they've never been interviewed before. And if they decide who's in the group and where you meet, right, surveillance is a big deal for research. Surveillance is a big deal. Expect to get surveilled. And if it's in a war environment, you're going to be surveilled by the insurgents or the violent extremist group and the government. So, um, so they have to sort of point out when they're available, who should be there, and then it becomes their interview. And then I, they're the teachers, and I'm writing everything down. And I write everything down, never record. And because the concern from in most places is somebody might get that. And then I'm, gonna get, I'm in trouble. So that's 
The rest is in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. One other, one other question. So we have here the Summers trilogy, which, yeah. which presumably will be coming out as a box set, a box set <laughs> and then serialized and so on. So the, the first two um, are, are stuck right. about Rwandan youth and then the outcast majority, which is the whole, whole of Africa. So my question, and then the young fighters, the, 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 the final contribution to the, to, to the opus. Um, to what extent does this travel? Okay, um, so you, you mentioned Burundi, you, um, and, and there was something different about Burundi. Um, but you also mentioned other places outside the African continent, where it does resonate. And, and I think I sent you a few weeks ago um, a, a little news clip about a, a, a fighter in Khartoum who was called Tupac. Well, or called himself Tupac. Right. And you, and you were totally unsurprised by that. Yeah. Um, so my question is, what are the contours of this outside Sierra Leone? And, uh, and I mean, I think... Or, 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 or if you were to rewrite this, you know, mm. would it have a different? Uh, a different yeah. threat. Well, so this is outcast. So there is stuff about Tupac mm -hmm. and Marley in here. Yeah. Um, and talking about how ubiquitous they are and how they are locally interpreted. And I mean, Marley really is to this day all over the world. And what one of the things that's interesting is what underclass youth here is not what elites um, in the West here. So and a lot in the, the media is that promotes Marley as, as unthreatening, right? He's about love, about togetherness, about peace. Yeah, he is. But um, most uh, people in the world, that's not what they're hearing. They're hearing resistance and knowing who you are, right? Could you be loved? Oh, that's nice. Let's have a Corona and sit on the beach and listen to Marley. And let's not listen to what he's really saying. Right? And could you be loved, just as an example, because it's a popular song. What is he saying? Don't let him fool you. Don't even try, don't let him try to school you. You've got a mind of your own. Right? And so go to hell if what, if what they're saying is not right. Staying alive. That's what people are listening to. So Marley is able to speak to virtually every young person in the world, as far as I can tell, and a lot of adults. And um, so there is this ubiquitous part of popular culture. Um, and I, I guess I would say also that popular culture, I've really been taught how important they are. Taylor Swift says, register to vote. Mm -hmm. 35,000 do in an instant. Don't tell me that popular culture isn't important. Um, I found with Tupac, a lot of adults don't like him. And he wants to make you uncomfortable. He wants to tell you exactly what he's thinking and what he's going through in his life, right? Me and my girlfriend, it's about his gun. And so does he want to have a gun? No, he talks about being trapped and being forced to have one. And it's just the way it is. And he has to accept that. And he's a thug because he has no choice. And all those kinds of things, that's pure alienation. And so, I think we can learn from this. And I would say when you're working with young people, it's really important to find out who are they looking up to? And don't judge, right? Try to understand what their interpretation is, because I'll guarantee you, you're going to learn a lot. <coughs> if you make these teenagers your teachers, get ready, because it's really going to surprise you. Okay, thank you.